Well, good morning again, my friends. Let's uh, let's have some devotions together. Let's keep majoring in the minors. Look at another minor prophet. Today we'll be looking at the prophet Zephaniah. And let me tell you, if you haven't read Zephaniah this morning, push pause right now, push stop, close the browser, close your computer, whatever you're doing, and just go read the scriptures. It's not a long book, but man, it's a book that maybe we read once a year if we're a through the Bible in a year kind of person, but maybe this is a book you haven't thought about for years. If that's true, just go read it. And as you read it, like like all of the minor prophets, there's some difficult to understand stuff, but also it's not so much hard to understand. It's just hard to read, you know, because there's a lot of condemnation, a lot of judgment, a lot of pain involved. And sometimes that's hard to read. And I wonder if that's just something we're dealing with as we read the minor prophets is just say, man, it seems like God's really upset all the time. This is maybe this is that angry God of the Old Testament that the world talks about. And and although it, so first of all, God's not mad all the time. There were seasons where the people were super idolatrous and condemnate or judgment consequences are coming. And and so God sends prophets to warn his people of this coming consequence. But that's not the story of the whole people of God. Um, but it is the story of these seasons that the minor prophets are really focused on. So, but also as you're reading through the minor prophets, I wonder if you're seeing lament after lament and you're starting to think, man, I'm starting to see a pattern with these laments. I'm starting to understand the the literary structure of them. I'm also starting to understand the heart of a lament in the life of a believer and a life of, of, of a God follower. And, you know, once you understand, we've kind of been talking starting last year with the, with the Psalms uh, last summer, we've, we've mentioned lament an awful lot this year, just from the pulpit and in small groups and all of that. And, and I, and, and I wonder if when you start seeing laments being written in the old Testament, you go, man, these are everywhere. Like there, this is not a rare thing. This is something that's happening all the time in the Old Testament. And I, I wonder also if you, as you continue to understand it, you're starting to see that an arc forms in most laments, that there's kind of, they start with sorrow and suffering and judgment and whatever, but they end with faith and many times peace. And I wonder if that's something that's important as we understand how to cry out to God with our sorrows, with our problems, that it really is an important way that we remind ourselves that we really do trust God. We get wrapped up in bad things going on. We get wrapped up in the worries of the day and we can very easily say, oh God, this is bad and this is bad and this is bad. And as we put those into words and we cry out to him, we also remember, but God, I know you're greater than this. And I know there is a plan for the future. And, and I do in the middle of all of this really trust you. And so many times lament does the same things in our lives as it did in the Old Testament that it begins with acknowledging the consequences of sin, acknowledging the worries of our day, but then it ends in faith. You know, Habakkuk was like that. We just talked about Habakkuk on these videos, and Habakkuk starts with, you know, God, why have you left us, and don't you see what's going on here, and I'm going to climb up on this wall and watch, and I don't see what you're doing, and, and then it ends with real profound statement of faith. The songs of lament in the Psalms are like that as well. I have my finger in a couple to just refer to, to remind you about. Psalm 22 st stands out in my mind. Psalm 22, as you know, Jesus quotes it from the cross and he says, My God, my God, the psalmist says, why have you forsaken me? So Psalm 22 starts with this, God, I don't see you around here at all. Where are you? But then also this is written in Psalm 22, verse 27 of that same chapter says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. So it starts with this feeling of abandonment, but then moves to a, a profound statement of faith and trust in God. And I wonder if that hasn't been true in your life too, that in the times when you were most concerned, most worried, that those were also the times where your faith in God was growing most deep. Psalm 43 is a short little psalm and a pretty good example of this as well. Psalm 43 starts with, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against the ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. This cry of like, 
I think I'm the only good guy left, man. There are bad guys all around, and God, I need an actual savior, not just a someday savior. I need to be vindicated. I need to be saved right now. Then that just five verses in this little song, and the last verse says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation, and my God. So the psalmist has talked himself out of worry. He's talked himself out of, of the pain as he is focused on God. Well, maybe the message of lament then, or maybe the message of this ark is this. In, as God's people, in God's family, in the kingdom of God, pain is where we are from, but joy is where we are going. Are you with me? Pain is where we are from and joy is where we're going. I like that. That's good. Somebody give me a high five. Look, we all ha- can tell stories of pain. The difference between being a believer and not being a believer is uh, we don't, I don't have any expectation that what I'm headed for is just the grave or that I've been forsaken by God or that, um, that there's only pain in my future. Rather, pain is where I'm from. But joy is where I'm headed. And I think most of us would say we're somewhere in the middle right now. There's still pain. They're still crying out. But man, there's also joy. And I anticipate the fulfillment of that joy sometime very soon. So in Zephaniah, I say all of that, six minutes, 38 seconds to tell you this. Zephaniah is that same story from God's perspective. So if a lament are people crying out, God, why have you forsaken us? Everything's bad. Bad guys are surrounding me. I need to be saved and ends with God. I trust you. I know you're there. I'm going to wait on you because I, I believe you. Um, Zephaniah is God's side of that perspective. So in Zephaniah, we're going to see it start with these words. God speaking in this verse two, it says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. There might be some hyperbole here, but God is serious about this. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal. God is looking at Jerusalem, at Judah, and he's seeing, we're going to hear names like Baal. We're going to hear names like Milcom as we read through this. And, and these are pagan, evil gods. I, we would say they're demonic gods, right? These are not only lesser than God, but these are evil. They oppress people. They, they're bad for a culture. And so, and so God says, look, I'm going to wipe out, like, pick a plot of land in Jerusalem. I'm wiping it out. I am going, it's a scorched earth theory. And so God starts with the brokenness of the relationship with the people. Just as in lament, the people are saying, God, it seems like this is broken. In Zephaniah, we see the beginning of God saying, this is catastrophically broken. There's going to be consequences for it. And then um, sometime as you're reading through the book, you're going to start to see, and I don't know that we've mentioned this a lot in the prophets, but it's a real theme of the, of the prophets in general, especially the minor prophets. You're going to see the name, the day of the Lord pop up. Now that's an interesting thing to, to think about the day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh, right? The day of the Lord, um, Yom Yahweh is by way, a much cooler way to say that, but look at how it continues down in verse 14 and following. That great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of that day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blasts and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. Like there is a day when God takes over and judgment comes. The day of the Lord is like, oh, is this the, the day of this king or the day of this prophet or the day of this priest? No, this is Yahweh's day. Yahweh is going to do stuff that is going to make no doubt that this is 
his day. He is the one going to make things happen on that day. So there's this great warning, and the great warning of the day of the Lord in Zephaniah extends to other nations. If you go to the next chapter, starting in verse 5, we won't read all this, but he's going to have things to say to the Canaanites. Oh, you of Canaan and the land of the Philistines. So it's not just like it starts in Judah and Jerusalem. It's extending to all of Palestine. Um, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. And so this, this, this day of the Lord, God is, is done waiting on people to repent and it's, it's time for consequences and, and it's not just going to be his people, but it's going to extend out to the surrounding nations. And, but then in verse nine of chapter two, you start to see the beginning of a, of a turn. Like you're, we're seeing the same arc. This is true, but this is true too. So in verse nine, you see, the remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. So it is true that God is going scorched earth. God is going to, to rain down consequences. And at the same time, there's going to be a faithful remnant that are not only going to make it through this, but are going to benefit by the day of the Lord. So in the middle of God's wrath, Zephaniah sees a future for God's people. You know, if we would just turn over then, and I hope you read it, and obviously we don't have time to cover all of it here, but if you if you continue reading and, and you see the other side of this arc at the end of the book, so it starts with this severe brokenness and consequences. But watch how it ends. In chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, For at that time I will change the speech of the people to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord. He's talking about those nations. So if you can kind of see it's like judgment, the book is kind of judgment on Judah, judgment on the nations, and then the day of the Lord, and then the coming out of the day of the Lord on the other side of judgment, on the other side of those consequences is joy and purpose for the nations and then joy and purpose for Israel. From beyond the great river of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. It's not going to hold, hold people accountable, the nations accountable anymore. There's going to be forgiveness. And the cross is enough even for the for the pagan folks, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly, and they shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, verse 12 says. And then go down to verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Man, this book ends very different than it starts. The Lord has taken away judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. Keep reading on your own, but just for now, let's go to verse 20. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. What a great promise for Israel. So you see how God starts in that same like arc of like brokenness and faith, God starts with, man, I'm going to have to bring the, my day. The day of the Lord is coming and there's going to be consequences and, and you're going to feel the effects of your rebellion and these surrounding nations are going to feel the effects of their sin. But the reason for that is not so that humanity would never thrive again. It is a saving fire. It is a consequence intended to refine, to bring back this remnant of faithful people to the point where there's hope for the nations, there's glory for Israel. And of course, that glory finds its ultimate purpose, its ultimate um, you know, fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. So, if you're in a time of lament, man, Go through the whole arc in your mind. God, things are rough and difficult now, but I do trust you. If you see brokenness in our world, know that God has sent his son so that the ark might be, yes, judgment is coming. And yet on the other side of that judgment is beauty and glory and hope. So let's live as people of hope. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.